first of all, by letting you know who I am, Jane Golly, the Director at the Australian Centre on China in the World. Uh, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the, all of the lands on which we're meeting today. Uh, I'm here in Canberra on Ngunnawal Nambri country. And I think particularly when we're um, engaging in a topic that will no doubt be touching on human rights, I would like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to all of you Professor Christopher Atwood. Uh, in fact, when this idea came up, uh, we had a couple of colleagues from the ANU who came to speak to Ben Penny and myself about the troubles that were unfolding in Inner Mongolia with relation to the language protests, and it was all quite distressing. And we were thinking carefully about what we could do, uh, recognising that there were some limits uh, on what some of those with Inner Mongolian connections could do to actively discuss the problems. Uh, and, you know, and that is a sign of the tense times that we live in. Uh, ben immediately came up with Chris's name and said, if there's one person in the world who we want to get to speak about this, it's Chris. Uh, unfortunately, Ben couldn't make it today uh, due to a, a health emergency with his elderly mother. So he sends his apologies. Uh, very sorry that he couldn't be here. Uh, Chris got his, his PhD from Indiana U, which many of the ANU people know we have a strong connection with. Uh, and I was very fortunate to travel there last year with the Vice Chancellor and to see one of my favourite campuses on earth. If you're a fan of brutalist architecture and you think Canberra is not a bad place, there's quite a lot of overlap between the two cities and it was a wonderful um, visit for me. Uh, he's currently Professor in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilization at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, I hope you're all surviving well through this very difficult year, Chris. Uh, and his specialty is Mongolia, also Inner Mongolia, uh, the, and the history thereof. And he's written a couple of books with some pretty, well, one with an inviting title, another one that reveals his deep knowledge, The Young Mongols and Vigilantes of Inner Mongolia's Interregnum Decades, uh, which I've just learnt was 1901 to 31, three decades in one book, uh, and also the, an encyclopedia of Mongolia and the Mongol Empire. Uh, so I'm going to take that as meaning that you know a far lot more about Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, certainly, than I do. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk today, Chris. Uh, given the title, Inner Mongolia, Three Words in the Wake of a Broken Strike. Uh, just before I pass over to you, we'll um, encourage, allow you to speak or invite you to speak for, I hope, 40 minutes or so. I'm not sure if, I, if there were any strict guidelines on there, but I'm imagining there will be lots of questions. I mean, take longer if you need it, and perhaps some people can stay over time as well. But then we'll have a Q&A where I'd love to hear people put, raise their hand using the participants thing and speak up if they're willing and brave, uh, or you could use the chat option. And I'm going to assume that you're all comfortable or can figure those two things out uh, by the time that comes. And either, Chris, depending on how, how much of a flow there is, you might be able to choose to take those Q&A yourself or I can try and field some for you if, if we get inundated. Uh, so without further ado, over to you, Professor Atwood, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for that, uh, Jane, for that introduction. I'd also like to thank Ben, Ben Penny, and also Lee Narangua, who also was involved in, in this, although they're, they're not here for various reasons, both uh, personal and uh, also, for, in the case of Donna, I understand um, uh, connected with the, uh, her uh, duties at ANU. Uh, I visited ANU as part of that uh, exchange with Indiana University when I was faculty member there. I visited once very long ago, and I'm very happy to visit again, if only virtually. So now I'm, I'm speaking to you from Lenape land, uh, which I acknowledge in the Delaware Valley. So the title of my talk is Inner Mongolia, uh, Three Words in the Wake of a Broken Strike. Uh, my title today is based on Yuhua's wonderful China in 10 words, except since I have rather less time to talk than in a full less book, I'm, you know, I'm only gonna give you three words for your money, not, not 10. Uh, for those in great suspense as to the three words, I will relieve your anticipation by telling you what those three words are, script, school, and nationality. In Mongolian, that would be bichik, um, 
let me actually, I'm going to go right now to the share screen because I have those written, I just realized I have those written out there. Um, so are you seeing my screen at this point? Great, uh, great. Um, so uh, my, the, for those in um, great spent, this is, uh, the three words are bichik, sorol, and undustan. Or in Chinese, wenzi, xue xiao, and minzu. But since you might feel a little bit cheated from only getting three words for your, for your hours of listening and asking questions, I'll throw in two other words. I will talk about a little bit about human rights and even uh, the word genocide. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how these words function in the debate, particularly in relationship to nationality and why I think maybe they're better at generating action uh, than they are actually um, some ways describing what's going on. I, um, I think I may have prepared remarks that are a little bit longer than um, the 40 minutes. So, uh, Jane, if you could signal to me at some point, um, uh, maybe about at about uh, 35 or 40 minutes, and I'll see if I can um, uh, wrap things up fairly quickly. I think, um, uh, I think the last section is a little bit, maybe a little bit repetitive. So I think I can just jump ahead and maybe you can, can ask any, any questions. And one other, uh, prefatory remark uh, I'd like to make before. My aim here as an old talks I've given on this topic is to be fairly specific to the situation of Inner Mongolia. I, I, and you may have other questions, uh, particularly about say, how this relates to Xinjiang or Tibet and so on. Uh, and I'd be happy to take them. But again, I, I wanna emphasize that the situation is actually somewhat different. The Inner Mongolian situation is rather um, uh, specificity, you could say, is something that I have, um, and want to emphasize. And I, I find also the, maybe just to begin, the, the, um, many such questions oftentimes uh, tend to assume that the situation that I'm going to be called nested nationalism or what my colleague at Cambridge University, Professor Bullock has called collaborative nationalism. Um, this, these questions often tend to assume that the, in the long run, it's not really possible and such nested nationalism will ultimately resolve itself into something much more, much simpler. Um, now, although such an assessment may be true and would seem to be rather more likely now than it was a year ago, such assessments problematic in denying the specificity of the Inner Mongolian situation. Perhaps a few decades from now, nested nationalism or collaborative nationalism will no longer be relevant concepts. But until that point, focus on China's Mongols being either fully and purely Chinese or else victims of genocide sort of existentially alienated from China is not really going to be an accurate description of their reality. So I'd like to open up uh, my, I'd like to open up my com remarks with an episode and a viral news story that unfolded online late last month. Uh, let's start first with a viral news story. In this story, Qi Xiaoyi, a teacher of music appreciation in Ningcheng, a county in southeastern Inner Mongolia's Cherfeng Prefecture, brought our students to appreciate music and ethnic or minzu uh, culture by teaching them a horse race or saima dance uh, that Murudultan, dance that they could do from their seats. Uh, the teacher choreographed the dance herself and from November 24th, the story went viral with a film of students getting uh, 550,000 shares and two, two and a half million views, even making it into the English language in the Southern China, South China Morning Press, the teacher's abilities to get our students to dance in unison from their desks was widely praised. Now, to some, this class was a classic scene of Inner Mongolia. One online commentator joked, and you say that Inner Mongolian students don't ride horses to class? In fact, however, Ningcheng is a county, not a banner. Therefore, it's an area in Inner Mongolia which does not practice um, ethnic autonomy at the county level, at least according to the Chinese autonomy law. There'll be more on that a little bit later. Historically, it was uh, historically it was a Mongol district. Uh, ethnic Mongols are in fact a relatively small minority, and you can see actually in the classroom, uh, all of the uh, signs is actually in Chinese. Uh, ethnic Mongols outside of China, some Mongols commented, "quote fault fake propaganda to show that the ethnic minorities are preserving their culture well," and noted the, the Chinese environment in, in the class. Strikingly, however, the idea that this idea of students dancing in their seats to horse race music was not distinctively Inner Mongolian or even new. In 2011, American teachers uh, in, uh, went to Shanghai and marveled as a music teacher, Miss Jin, and we don't get her given name, a teacher in Shanghai's Aizhou, Aizhou Elementary School, also guided her students to do horse race dancing in their desks as a way of music appreciation. 
So obviously, Qi Xiaoyi has taken this to a new level, but Shanghai kids are as able as Inner Mongolia's Han or ethnic Chinese at making coarse potions from their desks. Now, at the same time, from, 2000, from November 22nd, um, really up until yesterday, at least, um, a, a different movement was going on in Inner Mongolia's Mongolian language schools. Early in November, the independent state of Mongolia just discovered new cases of community transmission of the novel coronavirus in their country. And on November 11th, they declared a lockdown. So Mongolia has so far has had a great record in keeping out COVID-19. And I just should say this new wave peaked on November 24th with, on November 24th with what from the U.S. perspective is something, um, is sort of a joke, is 35 new cases per day. In the U.S., this is a rounding error. Uh, it's not even, no, not even worth counting. I think we have more of that than that in our, um, the county of uh, Delaware County where I'm living. <laughs> Uh, on, uh, but on November 22nd, a total of 64 Mongolians using Inner Mongolian language social network Baino from within China in Inner Mongolia announced that they had collected 22,490 yuan worth of donations to be sent to Hao Mongols. That's the usual Inner Mongolian word for those in independent or so called outer um, Mongolia to fund food and supplies. This movement has continued to the present. Just yesterday, the Inner Mongolian professor Gittelt delivered to the Mongolian consulate at Edenhot on the border of, between China and Mongolia, between Inner Mongolia and, and Mongolia proper. Donations from 240 people of 54,000 yuan and 10,800 masks. So the, um, now both episodes speak to aspects of modern Inner Mongolia. In one, we see a viral school dance. One of the many recently such viral things in China. We see that uh, uh, Mongolians all ride horses in this viral video, or maybe they should all somehow ride horses, even if they don't. Or perhaps this parallels the anxiety that ch Chinese children should be more active and spend less time in front of their screens. It's sort of a, a worldwide thing. Kids are spending too much time on their screens. They ought to be more active. Uh, and that seems to be informing other viral school dance videos. Most of all, we see that the boundaries of Mongolianness are rather vague. The ethnicity of the students is not marked, the classes in Chinese, the story is propelled to viral status with very little participation from Mongol, online Mongols. Now, the other story is even more timely, but in a rather opposite way. It tells us a lot about the changes and continuities in inner Mongolia's Mongolian schools after the authorities broke the student teacher strike that had been launched on September 1st in response to the changes in school policy. First, let's start the very 2020 aspects of the story. It's pandemic related, it's periodic lockdowns, efforts of people to respond and show care through the remaining online and electronic channels of communication. Since February, normal human contact has been suspended across the international frontier separating Inner Mongolia as part of the PRC from the independent state of Mongolia. Like Mongolia's, like China's famous mass diplomacy, but on a people to people level. But despite the lockdown, connectivity, connectivity between Mongolia and Mongolia has actually never been higher. The student-teacher strike and the ensuing uproar in the Mongolian communities in, uh, in Mongolia and the diaspora created what we can call the first truly pan-Mongolian social movement since the 1920s. And this brings us to our first word, script. Um, in a phrase that accompanies a letter from Inner Mongolians, most students in grad the first letter that I uh, was referred to most students and graduates from a Mongolian ethnic school in Inner Mongolia's Shilingal district on the border of Mongolia mentioned that they were sending the material through vertical script software, Basal Mongol Soft of Baino. This phrasing highlights some of the other issues going on in Mongolia today. The attempt of independent Mongolia to convert back to the traditional vertical script, which is retained in Inner Mongolia while it was abandoned in independent Mongolia in the 1940s for the Cyrillic script. So here we see our, uh, two. this is the traditional script and here's an example of the vertical script, uh, the Cyrillic script, excuse me. And now that's being referred to by a newly dominant phrase, Basal Mongol Bichik, vertical Mongolian script, or better to capture the nuance, you could say the standing tall Mongolian script. Well before 2020, Basal Hoch Mongol or Blue Mongol standing tall had become been a prominent nationalist organization. And we now have this, it's now become the, the go-to word for the script. As the Mongolian poet, uh, Che Tumen Baya, wrote on September 1st, 2020, When my state stood tall, my native script stood tall. 
When my script stood tall, we too stood tall. This is one of those few sudden common fashions of speech sweeping the two areas, even as in other respects, standard Mongolia, inner Mongolia and standard Halkh of the independent Mongolia are moving apart. So we have two different school movements in inner Mongolia in two very different worlds. If the first speaks to the muteness and porousness of inner Mongolian boundaries, the other, taking place almost entirely in Mongolian language, speaks to the still strong borders of language that wall off ethnic Mongolian social reality from Chinese knowledge, Chinese understanding of what's going on on the other side of that language barrier. All of which is to say, with the clear defeat of the student teacher strike and the upcoming changes in the Mongolian language education system in China, the force of linguistic centralization and uh, coerced national homogenization are certainly winning the battle, but it's not entirely clear that they're winning the war. So let's go back and summarize what happened in Inner Mongolian schools this summer. During the high Maoist period of the PRC and afterwards from 1949 to 1989 or so, albeit with a massive and uh, bloody hiatus in the cultural revolution, China pursued a bilingual education model for five favorite minority languages, Mongolian, Uyghur, Tibetan, Korean, and Kazakh. In it, education would be primarily in the minority language with Chinese taught as a topic. This model was enshrined in the PRC's constitution and in the autonomy laws, the right to quote, use and develop, note that word, develop, minority languages. The PRC is a de developmental state and only languages that can be developed, that is to say, be used for increasingly modern purposes have the right of linguistic citizenship in this developing China. So we can call this, and it's been called model one bilingual education. Minority language for these five favorite languages is the medium. Chinese language is a topic. From roughly 2000 on, however, policymakers often, uh, often associated with the slogan second generation ethnic policy, have argued for a mirror image policy in which Chinese is the medium of education, the language in, classes, in which classes are regularly taught, and um, uh, minority languages are taught as a topic, the way, for example, English uh, is taught as a topic. Call this model two bilingual education, because at least on paper it still does allow for education in minority languages. From 2004, this became the aim of educational policy in Xinjiang, at least. An example of how this would look in practice can be seen from this, and here we on the, the screen, we have a 2019-2020 school schedule for a school uh, in the Mongolian Autonomous County outside of Inner Mongolia in the neighboring Chinese province of Liaoning. Uh, you can ignore these black things. This was the person I received this from at mark them for a different reason. Uh, but the blue here marks the Mongolian language classes. This is the first year, first semester, first year, second semester, first year, second year, first semester, second year, second semester, and so on down to the sixth year. These, uh, this is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and so on. You'll notice that there's a one Mongolian, one Mongwen or Mongolian language. There's a separate class taught one hour each day with all the other classes in Chinese. Now, this is not nothing. In comparative spe perspective, actually, an hour a day in the minority language is actually fairly generous in the world comparative per perspective. Although, contrary to some claims, such a level of minority language education is not a monopoly of China. Now, in 2020, at least a partial form of this Model 2 bilingual policy became law all over Chinese, uh, uh, China's autonomous regions, pre prefectures, and counties, where it had not yet already been implemented. The means by which this happened was through creating a new Ministry of Education approved textbooks for three classes, Chinese language and literature, morality and law, and history. The new ministry approved textbooks were to be implemented in minority language education, but without translation. In other words, these three topics would have to be taught purely in Chinese throughout the country. Xinjiang and the Tibet Autonomous Region had this policy in place by 2018. This year, in 2020, it was implemented in the other Tibetan regions, Korean regions in Northeast China, and in Inner Mongolia. The company of this was a whole slew of other changes, minor in themselves, but all tending in the same direction. So in fall, for example, uh, 2019, for example, doctoral students were no longer allowed to write dissertations in Mongolia. So if you were working on your dissertation in Mongolia, you'd have to uh, put it into Chinese. Now, in the Tibetan and Korean regions, the policy is, was implemented fairly openly and without much opposition. Already in April 2020, for example, it had been announced that in the Lawa region of Sichuan, Tibetan would be restricted to the Tibetan language classes. 
They already were announcing the employment of thousands of new teachers hired to supplement the teaching staff that were used to previously teaching in Tibetan. Discontent was predicted, but so far there hasn't been heard any dramatic events such as what happened in Inner Mongolia. In Inner Mongolia, however, the sum, over the summer, the leadership knew that the policy would lead to trouble. The chairwoman of the um, autonomous region government, Bu Xiaolin, a Mongol from a prominent Red Princess family, the granddaughter of the famous Olangu, sent officials to Beijing over the summer trying in vain to delay the changes. But if the, but if the policy couldn't be changed, as it turned out, its uh, full unpacking could be delayed. At least at first in June, they said it's just going to be in southeastern Inner Mongolia, a region traditionally seen as more sinicized and compliant. It was not until August 17th, literally 13 days before classes start, that it was announced that the policy would be extended all over the region. And until August 23rd, there was a vigorous and free discussion of the merits of moving from Model 1 to Model 2 bilingual education, a discussion that was overwhelmingly hostile to the idea. I suppose there, there I've seen one or two videos of, of Mongolians actually saying this would be a good idea, but the, the opposition was really quite overwhelming. Opponents pointed out that the Mongolian language education had been successful in producing graduates who are, who are themselves successful and high functioning in Chinese society. People like Shorkan, uh, famous uh, for uh, creating the first test tube goat in the world um, uh, uh, in, um, uh, bio in biology and others in aeros aeronautics, aerospace, Boyan Hishik, um, and Professor Tinhua in aeronautics. Indeed, literacy among Mongols in Inner Mongolia is actually higher, not lower, than literacy among Han Chinese in Inner Mongolia. But on August 23rd, however, Chinese social media censorship machine moved into action. Bano, the Mongolian language version of WeChat, was temporarily suspended, and all discussions of the policy were eliminated. Soon, the new, uh, the new textbooks for what had previously been just uh, uh, New textbooks were put out, and people noticed also a number of small, strange, little changes. Uh, a few Mongolian essays were removed, even in the Mongolian language textbooks for this remaining Mongolian language class, uh, and translated essays from Mao Zedong were inserted. But resistance remained widespread. Petitions to cancel the policy, uh, to cancel the policy continued. Uh, so here we see some teachers uh, teaching the Shilingo, calling for a strike. Uh, people signing petitions. Petitions to continue, no centralized count of the signatories is possible, but th scores of thousands of heads of families certainly signed. And this is 5,700 signatures in Hishikden Banner. Population of the banner is, a uh, Mongol population is probably only about 20,000. Uh, so essentially, it's everybody in the banner signed. Uh, for a few weeks of drama, students tried to escape uh, their boarding schools. School teachers and principals joined the strike and education officials refused to discipline them. Famous bands signed their, signaled their support. And all these actions were documented in videos smuggled out to this very well-developed network. The authorities responded with warnings, with arrests, and with threats to fire people. Up to eight officials and students caught in the middle committed suicide under pressure. Uh, the family of Sorna and Alashan released pictures of the Buddhist funeral after a suicide. In the memorial service for Olan, the principal of Eren Hot's Mongolian Middle School, by the way, that was one of the schools that sent, um, was sending masks and making contributions to Mongolia just recently. Uh, there's a principal that committed suicide in the middle of this movement. Um, her memorial service would have become a big, uh, was threatening to become a rally point of resistance until the government clamped down on movement from Ohat to Eren Hot. And they, uh, they also began detaining and confiscating the cell phones of those organizing collective mourning. By September 21st or so, the strike was broken and the schools returned back to normal. But during those three weeks, however, for the first time in my memory, Inner Mongolian and Half Mongolians joined together in a single social movement. Defenders of Chinese policy love to point out how Inner Mongolia, unlike independent Mongolia, is still using the traditional script while Mongolia switched to the Cyrillic or Russian alphabet to write their language. Now, however, that fact backfired since it raised the stakes in Inner Mongolia in preserving the script. Demonstrating for Inner Mongolian language became a way of defending their vertical script. And here we see a cartoon uh, of it by um, uh, someone that um, Satsol, is known a very famous cartoonist. Um, 
coming during Fakbair. He, when Mongolia's sitting president, Batolik, did the symbolic opening of the school year with primary, sc primary school students, he pointedly asked a student to read a poem on the Mongolian script, not, interestingly, the, not the language, a script written by an inner Mongolian. Still constrained by Mongolia's dependence on China, however, he could only use symbolic methods of criticism. Freed from the demands of officially placating the Colossus of the South, however, Mongolia's former president, Ilbuk Dorch, was much more openly supportive and got in a public spat with Mongolia's ambassador to, um, uh, with Mongolia's, sort of a public dispute with uh, Chai Wenrei, who was Mon China's ambassador to Mongolia. And when um, China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, dropped by Ulaanbaatar on the way back from Europe on September 15th, there were protests in Ulaanbaatar and his offer of 70 million yuan in aid was denounced as hush money. But the ever pragmatic Mongolians didn't, of course, turn it down just because it was hush money. Meanwhile, in Inner Mongolia, the fearful transition to bilingual education model two has been stalled at what I would call, as I mentioned, model 1.5. In other words, the policy has for now stuck to the letter of what was in fact announced. Bino is back up. Resistance takes the form of posting videos of children practicing Mongolia at home or singing Mongolian songs in Mongolian class at school. On November 13th, the region's Inner Mongolian region's party secretary, Sher Taifung, went to the heavily Mongolian Shilingal district to lambaste its officials for not supporting the new language policy. From September 27th to December 2nd, advertisements went on outside, went out, outside the region to recruit 300 new teachers to teach the three new topics to be taught all in Chinese. In Shilingal, where the shortage of teachers capable of teaching in Chinese was most dire, 215 new teachers were to be recruited, of which there were 33 in Mongolian and 182 in Chinese. But at the same time, this movement to send aid to Mongolia, I'm talking about the vertical script, uh, was continuing. Language homogenization depends on sealing the border. Despite the pandemic, the abortive two-week strike in September broke through the kind of icy emotional barrier between Mongolia and Inner Mongolia. So now having set the stage, I'd like to pull back and talk to mention one word, our um, script, I'd like to mention my second word, schools. The second word is sorol or xue xiao. Um, too often in discussions of this movement, it's been forgotten that it was centered on Inner Mongolia's Mongol language public schools. Public schools, schools run by the Inner Mongolian government and paid for by Inner Mongolian taxes. This is important to emphasize because it underlines how the very people who organized the strikes were themselves tied to the state in Inner Mongolia. Essentially, they were striking to persuade the government to allow them to control and have autonomy over institutions which ultimately were run by the government. And these institutions were themselves the fruit of deeply modernist assumptions about training and liberating Mongols from the shackles of previous ways of thought. Richard Harla, the first Inner Mongolian writer to be inspired by modern Western novels, published his Struggling in a Sea of Suffering in 1940. In this novella, he looked back on the chaotic rule of the Republic of China from the relative stability of Japanese rule in Inner Mongolia. In it, he told the story of two Mongol boys, each caught up in the coils of the Buddhist monastic system, where Tibetan was the only language taught. Chadikch was a bandit. You know, you got a poor boy who turned, had to turn bandit and eventually turned into a fake incarnate lama making up magic spells in order to entrance the local prince. Joraktu was a poor boy sent by his stepmother to the monastery to get him out of the house. As it turned out, Jorakt got sent to the monastery built by the banner or district's corrupt prince to honor Chetakch. And so when the pressed Mongols revolted against the heavy tax and burned the monastery down, the young novice uh, Joraktu was freed and wandered home. And now I'll just read the last, last passage of this novella. But when he thought to return to his home, not only had his Joraktu's grandmother and grandfather passed away, but he suffered all sorts of grief from his stepmother alone in the house. So as he went here and there, serving others, making a living by trading his labor, by chance he came into the service of an accomplished scholar, Teacher Ha. Working diligently at his tasks under him, when Joraktu got some free time, he had the te teacher school him in Mongolian words. From his childhood, he had always been eager to learn his letters, but this seemed 10,000 times easier and more delightful than to memorize the Tibetan words of a foreign tongue. As he worked hard at it night and day, he could not only understand, but he soon found it no great hardship to even compose verses. 
Two years ago, when Teacher Ha came to the capital on business and stayed there a while, Jaratu began to train in Chinese words. From last year, he found it not difficult to translate between Chinese and Mongolian and read in both, and he has been doing so to this day. So, our novelist Rinchen Ha Law gave a happy ending to the story. A boy lost in poverty and superstition found liberation in a teacher who could teach him his own language. And that learning in his own language would eventually lead to the city and to translating between Chinese and Mongolian. It is afterward, Rinchen Ha was at, at pains to stress that he wasn't against religion, just that students ought to learn first in their own language, not in Tibetan as they did in monasteries. And after the Japanese supported governments in Manchuria and Inner Mongolia were toppled by troops from the Soviet Union and the Mongolian People's Republic, Inner Mongolians trained in the new schools looked around for support. When the initial wave of pan Mongolian enthusiasm was dampened by the Mongolian People's Republic's refusal to accept their petitions for unification, Inner Mongolians turned to the Chinese Communists, who promised to maintain the same kind of autonomy, and specifically the Mongolian language schools, that the Japanese had already given to the Inner Mongolians. The KMT, meanwhile, banked on the support of revanchist Han Chinese, who resented the favored position that Koreans and Mongols had held under Japanese rule in Manjoguo, uh, compared to the disfavored Han. To make a very complicated story short, the communists won, and up to 1966, the new wine of communist class struggle was being poured into the old skins of schools and co cultural institutions, mostly staffed by students who had their start in first under Japanese auspices. As an interesting side note, not surprising, the Japanese remained the dominant foreign language in Inner Mongolian schools until after the 1990s. Now, understanding the texture of Mongolian language schools in Inner Mongolia is sometimes dif difficult because the glass is so clearly half full and sometimes it's so clearly half empty. Let's talk about the half full first. Mongolian schools were unique community institutions for reasons I'll explain under inseparable, or under the, uh, excuse me, nationality, they have been essentially the only place in Inner Mongolia's larger towns and cities where Mongols could meet and interact with each other in their own language and on their own terms. Um, as a MA student from Indian University in one of my classes showed in his wonderful, in a nice MA thesis, when a single boarding school campus had Mongolian language and Chinese language tracks, students and teachers in the two tracks developed powerful rivalries. In the sparsely settled rural areas of Mongolia, where most Mongols lived in schools, transmitted a modern curated version of Mongolian culture based on the Betamja Ayalgo. In the 2000s, Chinese, or standard dialect, I should say. In the 2000s, Chinese policy began to accelerate the existing tendency towards urbanization. Um, Sorry about that, I think I lost my... Um, sorry about that. Um, so, it, Chinese policy began to accelerate, from the 2000s, Chinese policy began to accelerate the existing tendency to urbanization. Poverty alleviation programs began coordinated plans to move small holding rural Mongols to, into new apartment blocks in the city, leaving the vacated grasslands opening for mining, industrial dairy farming, or other highly capitalized business ventures. It's kind of a convenient mnemonic for understanding Chinese policy that poverty alleviation and primitive accumulation both begin with the same letters. Rural schools were closed down or replaced by larger boarding schools, centralized one per banner, as well as some selective and specialized Mongolian language border schools. Here, for example, this is a picture of an old air, um, uh, homes that have been um, condemned, basically as sort of in grassland areas, moved into these larger multifamily uh, homes. Uh, there's one of our residents in front of them. Uh, this is in, in, uh, near the uh, banner, uh, in, in your banner center. Banner is a county level unit in Inner Mongolia where Mongols exercise autonomy more on that concept a little bit later. Now, so the percentage of ethnic Mongols being educated in Mongolian language schools declined from a, a high of about 60% in 1990 to a little over 30%, maybe 35% today. 
And even in them, half empty is still a reality. Uh, as educational researchers have already shown, while the open curriculum in Mongolian schools elevates Mongolian, the hidden curriculum very much exalts Chinese ways of knowing and being. Even setting aside politi explicit political instruction, the content of every class except language and literature is already translated from Chinese. Um, so the, uh, uh, but for the moment, Mongolian language schools still survive as separate institutions. A reduction of Mongolian language class to one hour a day would make the preservation of separate Mongolian and Chinese tracks in schools hardly necessary. Uh, the Model 2 bilingual education will certainly tend, and this was hap what happened when it was fully implemented in Xinjiang, this Model 2 mo model uh, resulted in the merger of Uyghur and Chinese schools. Uh, but given the resistance, the full Model 2 has been shelled in Inner Mongolia, and instead a kind of Model 1.5 is in place for now. New teachers are being recruited, but they will be plugged into schools in which, to judge from ethnographic accounts, Mongolian language teachers and administrators have up until now been most, mostly running things. It's anyone's guess whether, or more real, realistically when, there will come a tipping point when Chinese teachers from the outside of the region, who of course will not learn Mongolian, we can tell that for, for certain, uh, will be numerous enough that staff meetings simply have to be conducted in Chinese and the Mongols, well, Mongolian teachers will lose their ownership of their schools. Third word is nationality. So we're on our third word, Jane. Um, schools are an institution for propagating the Undistin. And let me just show you here the a new school, the Cherfung Mongolian Experimental School. Um, they got a new rebuilding just on um, August 31st this year. Let's go to nationality, Undistan Minzu. Different words for uh, these. This is the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region in blue here, it's, uh, plus some other regions of China. Nice map from Wikipedia. Uh, schools then are an in institution for reproducing the Undistan. Here I use the Mongolian term, which corresponds to Chinese Minzu, although it actually preceded it in official use by a few years. Etymologically, the term stems from Undis root. That term was first taken over to designate nation of Mongolia after the 1921 revolution. After 1945, in the derivative form Undistan, one was with the same root, it followed the Mongolian and Soviet troops into Inner Mongolia, where it became the term of choice for revolutionaries describing their Mongol nationality, Undistan. Since 1949, of course, this word has existed in a symbiosis with Chinese Minzu. And Minzu itself is notoriously difficult and hard to pin down. Although it and its cognates in Chinese and Korean designate nation in the sense of an effective community rallying around a state, it was also chosen to designate the 56 nationalities or ethnic groups into which the population of the People's Republic of China was eventually to be divided. These Minzu, in that sense, are a constitutionally defined component part of the people that created the People's Republic of China. In this sense, this term too, like Undistin, was a Calc translation from Russian Narodnost. The process of translating Narodnost into Minzu actually began in the 1930s when the Chinese provincial government of Xinjiang began its definition of its population as 15 nationalities, with one exception, merging the small Taranchi into the larger Uyghur, Milet or Minzu. This definition was then taken over without change by the New People's Republic and expanded to the rest of the country. The constitutional definition of Uyghur, Milet, Mongol, Hundustin, or Chinese Minzu, all calc translated from the Russian definition was thus an area of common ground between the various nationalists of Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, and China proper in the 1940s and 50s, all of whom could adopt this framework to define their people. Since 1990, however, a movement of academics and think tanks and universities in Beijing and elsewhere have been promoting a redefinition of Minzu and its constitutional role. This second generation ethnic policy movement has Contributions can be roughly sum, summed up as saying we should fill this term Minzu with content derived from English ethnicity rather than with content derived from Russian Narodnost. Ethnicity should be uh, individual, fluid, non political, and non institutional. Not, Narodnost, however, is collective, bounded, political, and institutional. Now, such a de institutionalized, depoliticized, as they say, Chu Zhenjiehua definition of Minzu has encountered two large obstacles. The first is that the original version was written as a PRC constitution as embodied in this system of autonomous units that you see here in the map. The second obstacle to such definition, at least in Inner Mongolia, is that while Chinese thinkers may have ownership of the term Minzu, 
They don't have ownership of the term Hundustan, the Mongolian version. The Inner Mongolian Hundustan has a life of its own, one embedded not just within the PRC's constitutional framework, but within the life and thought of ordinary Mongols. And what this conception adds up to, I'd argue, is one of nested nationalism. And in this concept, the, the Mongol Hundustan, like the Hetad Hundustan, or Han, or ethnic Chinese nationality, is nested within the Dondatolas, or middle country. More than any other language in China, Inner Mongolian, Mongolian in China has internalized this idea of nested levels. Thus, if, if uh, an idea, uh, a person or thing is not of one's own nationality, that's to say not ethnic Mongol, it is had. But if it's from outside the borders of China, it is gadat. So there's two different words to say foreign, what might be considered foreign or different from us. Both in English would be foreign and in independent Mongolia as well, the two overlap, had, gadat. But in Inner Mongolia, they're consistently distinguished in popular speech. Similarly, if something pertains to the Han ethnic group, it is Hetadin, but if it pertains to the PRC, it's Dontadin. When Inner Mongolians speak Chinese, they pretty much never use the usual Chinese Zhongwen for Chinese language, so it's Han Yu. And this wasn't introduced by Chinese into Mongolian, it was actually something that developed organically, you could say, from the late 19th uh, up through the first half of the 20th century. Now this Mongolian experience this runs contrary to the often expressed idea that nations and nationalism must be unitary concepts. The idea that as Rupert Emerson put it, quote, the nation is the largest community which when the chips are down effectively commands men's loyalties, overriding the claims, both of the lesser communities within it and those which cut across it or, or potentially enfold it within a still greater society. In this sense, it's my experience that ethnic Mongols and inner Mongolia do not have a nation, but rather have an olus country, an undistin, a nationality, neither of which is the final object of loyalty, but both of which, most of the time, run along parallel tracks. And I refer here, in the interest of time, I talked to the, uh, um, uh, some material by a sociologist, Wen Feng Tang and Gao Chao uh, He. Their research has some problems, but I think it fits what I'm talking about. They title their article, um, Separate but Loyal. Um, we could, you could ask about that perhaps in the Q&A if you like. So I'll just um, skip over that in the interest of time. So this is a context in which you can read repeated statements by the strikers that what they're striking for is uh, on behalf of the guarantee found in both the Constitution and in the PRC's 1984 minority autonomy law that, quote, all nationalities have the freedom to use and develop their own spoken and written languages and to preserve or reform their own folkways and customs. And that regional, autonomy, author, uh, regional autonomous authorities are bound to respect those rights. Now, the context here is clearly developmental. The aim of the law is not to preserve Mongolian languages, customs as they were in 1945 or 1845, but to develop and reform them in accordance with the modernist ideas shared by Mongol nationalists, nationalists as well as uh, Chinese communists. But just as obviously, if in, in 2018 one could defend a dissertation of Mongolian, in 2020 you can't. And if in 2019 you can study Chinese history in Mongolian, and in 2022 you'll no longer be able to do so, that's a three-year implication of policy, this is not development of the Mongolian language, but regression. In other words, strikers are right that this new model of bilingual education runs directly against the letter and spirit of both the PRC constitution and the 1984 autonomy law. At this point, we can only really wonder about Beijing's insistence on ramming it through anyway, and on making sure that regional autonomous officials from chairwoman Bu Xiaolin on down to the school principals are seen publicly assisting the effort uh, what's this going to do to the sustainability of Mongolian nested nationalism? It's very hard to say. But at the same time, it's important to notice what frameworks were rejected in appealing to the PRC constitution and to the 1984 autonomy law, precisely because these frameworks are the preferred frame, uh, certain rejected frameworks are the preferred framework for scholars and activists outside China. The first framework is what we can call anti-developmentalist diversity. In this framing, the very idea of a modern state, whether capitalist or state socialist, with its imperative schooling to serve economic growth and power is viewed with deep suspicion. People's right to use their spoken and written language, that's okay, that's legitimate, but the right to develop them, that sounds, that's inherently bound up with development, developmentalist assumptions that privilege certain dialects and registers. Preserving folkways and customs, that may be worth defending, but the right to reform them, this conjures up shades of Foucault's discipline and punish, and the 
position of biopolitics on people previously uncoordinated with these agendas. Now, these are important points, but it must be remembered that a movement centered on preserving a certain vision of public schooling is inherently linked to, complicit, if you will, a modernist biopolitical agenda of disciplining and conditioning students to speak in ways at least somewhat different from their parents. It's important to remember that just as the Inner, uh, Inner Mongolia's party secretary, Sheriff Taifung, inherits one genealogy of nationalist mobilization, so too the leaderless protest movement inherited another modern nationalist genealogy, filled with figures that Sheriff Taifung probably has never heard of, Shorgan, Hafunga, Merse, Temgit, Gongsang Norb, and Injunash. Now the other excluded framework is that of human rights, human, not civil. Outside of China, this framework is preferred precisely because it breaks down the boundary between China and the rest of the world. Inner Mongolia can join, should join Xinjiang and Tibet as a place that human rights can be, in which human rights can be defended against the state through an international movement. Now, the acme of this framing is genocide. In this case, the intervention of the activists between the state and the target population is not only optional, it's required. The state must intervene to prevent genocide. Now, in the case of this language reform in Inner Mongolia, unlike the grisly tortures of the Cultural Revolution, the genocide we can be talking about could only be cultural genocide, a concept which has been in, in existence since the term genocide was first formulated in 1944, but has yet, in fact, not been enshrined in any in international legal instrument. So the problem with such framings is, once again, they don't make much sense of a movement that took its form as a school strike. Certainly, education in one's mother tongue is recognized by the United Nations as an inherent good. As Fernand de Varenne, a Canadian special rapporteur, stated in March to the Human Rights Council, education in a minority language is more cost-effective in the long term, reduces dropout rates, leads to noticeably better academic results, particularly for girls, improved level of literacy and fluency, fluency in both the mother tongue and the official or majority language, and leads to greater family and community involvement. All true all true. But in practice, such statements are all qualified by the proviso, which De Varenne mentioned several times in his uh, speech on this topic, where practical, where practical we should do this, where practical we should do that. And as a result, it's re yielding recommendations, not legally actionable cases. Now, one could say the school strike found itself in an impasse, therefore, not just because of police and school repression uh, and organizational repression, but because of structural investment of the Mongol in Hindustan and institutions actually controlled by the PRC. I'm aware of time, so I'm just gonna end right here. Uh, I just wanna make one last comment, which is that nationality is the only social grouping in China which is not allowed to organize itself apart from the state. Tai Chi enthusiasts can organize a Tai Chi association. Labor, union workers, can, they can organize a union. Uh, they're, they, these will probably have to be controlled by or somehow uh, managed by the state, but they can exist. Mongols can only organize in the form of the local autonomous government of Inner Mongolia. You can't actually have an independent non-governmental Mongolian organization in China, except for one that is bound up with the, the idea of promoting a culture, that is to say a school or an academic association. Hence the crucial role of schools. So I'm going to leave it right there, and I uh, hope to give you a little bit of time for questions, and sorry to go on for quite so long. Perfect, and a very, very engaging talk. Thanks so much. Uh, I do hope for all the Mongolians and the Mongolians that there's something hopeful uh, that comes for you in 2021, we all need it. But um, my yes. thoughts, are, my thoughts are with those who are suffering, uh, yes. and I wish you all the very best. Uh, I know that everyone would be clapping with me if they could to thank uh, Professor Atwood for just a, an engaging and really important speech. Thanks so much, Chris. <laughs> thank you so much.